Hello YouTube and welcome to What The Math. In this video we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're actually going to be combining fantasy with science fiction. Or I guess, just science. Specifically, I decided to take a look at one of the simulations that has been added to Alpha 15.2. And I'm talking about the simulation that's under the fictional simulations right here in this, in this particular location. This is actually uh, called Lens of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. So, just as you guessed it, this is actually a games of Game of Thrones simulation. And what this basically represents is the attempt by uh, developers of this game to kind of recreate um, the Game of, game of Thrones universe, but um, specifically they wanted to focus on something that is still unexplained in the books and in the movie. And I'm of course talking about the climate. If you've never read the book, if you've never watched the show, you'll probably not really get it. But if you have read or uh, read the books or watched the show, you'll know that in the story, the climate, specifically the seasons, are completely unpredictable. For example, in the book, the profession of magister, I believe that's what it's called, uh, how it's pronounced, uh, is to essentially predict the, the seasons, predict when the summer and the winter will come, because in the actual story, um, and also in the movie, the seasons are very, 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 very random. Now, what the, uh, the developers decided to do is probably, uh, they tried to actually explain um, why why the land of Westeros and actually all other lands, this is actually named incorrectly, I don't know why they named Westeros, should be known as the known world. This is known as the known world. So the only name we know for, for their actual, I guess, planet, you could call it. So here, they try to explain how the temperature uh, fluctuates and varies. Uh, and they did this by introducing not one, but two suns orbiting in this fashion. Now, this is what this was their explanation, and it, to some extent it does make sense. So if you actually look at the climb, uh, the temperature here, I'm going, we're going to use the graph for this, surface temperature. And I kind of like these graphs, so we're going to be using this a lot today. Uh, so if I do this, to th uh, let's look at it for a thousand years and also move it right here. If you look at this, you'll notice that there's a lot of fluctuation going up and down. And if I accelerate this a little bit, you'll see that it happens very kind of somewhat unpredictably. Like there's a lot of variation here and sometimes you don't really know where, where it's going to go and how it's going to occur. Uh, so to some extent, this does explain the uh, the seasons, but the only problem is that eventually this will actually have a pattern. Eventually you'll actually see that there's a bit of a uh, rep uh, repetitive pattern here, and at some point it will actually stabilize and be somewhat predictable. You'll always have these sort of hills and, and bottoms and hills and bottoms. Um, so, and the other thing is that, uh, let's just look, look at the stars from the surface, decreasing the time. Let's get go up here. Now, if you, if you look into the sky, and I'm just going to remove this for a second. If you just look into the sky and see this uh, night sky, you'll notice that there's two suns, right? There's two suns, and they'll also they'll be orbiting each other in a very, very funky fashion. Uh, let me just... Oh, I can't, we can't see it anymore, but let's just... Let's get off the planet and look at it from a distance. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So, if you look at this time accelerated, you'll see that they have this really, really cool dance, kind of like this. They're dancing around each other. Now, in the show, it's never really mentioned that they have two suns, that there's two stars. It's uh, We know uh, for a fact that there's one star and there is one moon in the sky. It's, it's mentioned many times in, in throughout the show. We also get to see um, in the actual TV show and in the books it's mentioned uh, for sure. And in TV show, in the TV show, we also get to see the horizon, we get to see the sunset. Uh, not not sunrise, but definitely sunset, and we get to see the moon. So we know there's a moon, and we know there's only one star. Uh, further, furthermore, if you actually watch the introduction, which I'm going to show it to you right now, I'm going to turn off the music for a second, just because I want to. I just found this really cool, cool remix of Game of Thrones. So I'm going to play this as I play the music. Uh, so if I were to show you this, and here we go. So this is the introduction, and right right away you see the star. A star orbited by astrolabe. So astrolabe is actually um, an astronomical tool used to predict movement of stars and the sun, just to in order for you to predict uh, climate change. It's actually been used in the ancient times. Now the thing about this introduction is that it's it's sort of interesting. If you look closely, you'll notice that it does show you that this particular um, location is actually set inside a concave Earth. So right there you see. 
it kind of, it's basically inside the planet. It's sort of like if someone was literally living inside a planet and in the middle of this planet, you'll, you'll see in a second that there's actually, uh, there's some sort of a, a hot object, star-like object, so right there. And maybe, so basically this is object right here, maybe it's not really what we think. Maybe in the, in, the TV show is actually based inside a planet, which is why there's such unpredictable climate. Now, that was... A, that was an assumption someone made online and someone actually did try to explore this a little bit further but then we realized that you know what it, it's just it's impossible because this ne is never mentioned in the books and it's really only the introduction to the tv show that shows you that so this sort of an inside out earth or planet i guess uh where, where i guess you could kind of explain the um, randomness of climate that way but this whole planet thing um it's it's only in this TV show. It's only the introduction to the TV show, and it was probably chosen um, to represent the world itself. And it's really it's just it's more symbolic than anything else. Because really, what you want to see here is that the star and the fire plays a really important role, and there's also the ice that also plays the important role, which is really why um, the books are called uh, Fire and Ice. So in other words, the whole theory of having, you know, a world inside the world is probably incorrect. So there's got to be something else going on in there, even though it's a pretty good theory. And I mean, it gives you um, sort of a, um, a concept of Dyson Sphere in there, because, uh, you know, you could be living inside a sphere. And if you don't know what Dyson Sphere is, I'm going to show you a picture of this. So here's a good example of what Dyson Sphere would actually look like. It's basically a spherical world around a very, very hot object, so like a star or a sun, where you can essentially absorb the entire solar radiation from that object. But the thing is, this theory doesn't really fly with, with uh, Game of Thrones because we've seen the horizon many times in the TV show and it's also mentioned in the books, meaning that uh, uh, someone has to live on the outside surface, not the inside, because inside you won't really see any horizon, you'll just see uh, you'll see this. This is actually a person's leg here, and you, basically you'll see this kind of a, a landscape going into the distance. You won't really see the horizon. Whereas uh, in the books, we do see horizon, and I mean, it's it's mentioned so many times. So it has to be on the outside surface. So there's got to be something else going on. And so what else can be going on to make such an unpredictable climate in the game? Well, the actual explanation from uh, George R. R. Martin is that it's basically magic. He says it's magic, but you know what? We're doing science today, and we're going to try to explain it scientifically, and we're not going to settle for magic as an answer. So he did actually mention that he will eventually reveal the secret uh, at the end of the series, but... We can't wait that long. I have no patience. I have to figure it out now. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to explore some of the ideas. And at the end, uh, I'm going to try to give you my best theory, which is actually is based on sci scientific uh, uh, knowledge and basically a little bit of mathematics in there as well. And uh, we're going to start with something really simple. So th this is the most simplest theory is that the orbit of the actual planet is uh, not as circular, it's actually more elliptical, meaning that, here, I'm going to show you what I mean by this, by introducing a new planet, and you'll see what, what this means. So let's actually throw a planet in here, just for fun, uh, somewhere around here. So this, oh, no, too far. Let's throw another one. Here. Ah, I keep throwing them. Uh, at some point, they'll they'll start making elliptical orbits. There we go. That one, I think, is good. So as, as you can see, it's not circular. It's actually more elliptical. So it spends a lot more time in the colder regions, away from the star, uh, than it does closer to the star. But the problem with this is that this is very periodical. You can actually see that it's going to repeat after a few, um, you know, after a few revolutions. But in this case, uh, when you have two stars, though, it's actually a little bit more unpredictable because now there is two different bodies that will be responsible for gravitational field. And so in th in this particular scenario, at some point, this will happen, actually. The the planet will eventually swing off, swing off into the outer space and fly away. So we can't really have two stars. We have to have one star. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to start with a new simulation and make a completely new simulation from scratch. You put a sun in the middle. Um, now, the, the other thing is that um, the actual size of the planet in Game of Thrones is actually a little bit smaller than Earth. Someone did the math behind it, and they found that it's approximately 87% of the mass of Earth. Uh, not, not just the math, but the size of Earth. So, the actual uh, known world, as we know it, because there's no better name for it, uh, is a little bit smaller than the actual Earth. So we're going to make it just a tiny bit smaller. Let's just say it's going to be about 5888. Uh, yeah, 5800 kilometers. So it's a little bit smaller, but still pretty big. So 
this is it here. Now we're gonna play around with this planet and uh, we're going to be also watching the climate. I'm just gonna accelerate this so that it stabilizes a little bit. And we're gonna watch we're gonna be watching the temperature and the climate just to see how things change. So the first theory is you know more elliptical orbit. So this is a very simple uh, theory, but the thing is if you have an elliptical orbit, you'll have repetitive patterns. So probably not just elliptical orbit. So it's just not gonna give you enough explanation for why winters and summers and springs and falls are so unpredictable. Specifically, here's how unpredictable they are. This is actually from the wiki, and basically the known seasons here are shown to you, uh, you know, based on the age that we know. It's called, uh, uh, so AC represents uh, after Aegon's conquests, and basically it starts here. So we know that summer, the first summer, was around 99. The year 99 then we had spring after about uh, 20 20 years and there was an autumn after about 10 years then there was a winter for five years then there was another spring uh and and so on and so forth so i'm just going to look at winters because you know the books are about the winters so first winter uh, the, the, where we actually have age was uh, around 130. the second winter was 100 years later 231 so it, it took about 100 year period before the second winter came and this one according to the books are or is a terribly cruel winter so this was a very very bad winter meaning that it was super cold uh then the next winter came only after about uh, 20 years and then there was a very very short spring and then another winter for two years and then, oh, it's, yeah, so the, yeah, it's, it's actually right here. The uh, fall spring was right here for about uh, two months. And then there was another winter. And finally, after 20 years, we, we get another winter. This is actually where the books are right now. The long winter is coming. Uh, that's basically what, uh, you know, how the books are put in it. So this is 20 year di uh, difference. There's a 40 year break here. And then there's 100 year break here. So very unpredictable. Same goes for springs and summers and falls as well. You'll notice that there's actually not that many um, uh, summers, but there's quite a lot of uh, autumns and springs. So in it's very interesting how this is actually um, so unpredictable in comparison to real world. So this means that there's got to be something else going on. Now the other explanation I actually read online was that maybe it has some something to do with currents and winds, and uh, you know how, for example, in in our um, on our planet, uh, because of the currents and because of the warm water. Uh, England, which is right here, or the United Kingdom, I guess. The United Kingdom actually has much warmer temperature than uh, same city. So United Kingdom, which is right here, has uh, much warmer temperature than you know, uh, if you go in the same uh, longitude than basically cities in Canada or cities in like Russia, because here there's really n uh, no no currents or anything like that, but. England is surrounded by warm currents, so the weather here is a lot warmer than anywhere else on the same uh, longitude. Now, that can be one of the explanations, but I personally am not really satisfied with it because one, uh, you know, it's not really hard, it's not really easy to explain currents and winds and all that, and two is that it's just not that cool. So we're gonna look for something a little bit more scientific or at least scientifically interesting. So the last theory I'm going to talk about is actually something that I think is really happening and uh, I'll show it to you when we look at the temperature. So the theory is actually called the Milankovitch cycles. Now this is an, a real phenomenon that actually exists um, on our planet and also on Mars. And what this refers to is various variations on a very, very long time scale. So for example, the eccentricity of our planet, which is basically how circular or how elliptical the orbit is, changes every 100,000 years. So um, every 100,000 years it goes between zero, which is basically a circle, to a more elliptical orbit where our Earth actually gets, gets about 6% less solar radiation at the farthest point. So in other words, what it does is this. And I'm going to show it to you in a game. So it goes from a circular orbit like this. I'm going to accelerate this. From a circular orbit to a more elliptical orbit uh, with eccentricity of about, I don't know, like about 0.10. So at some point, our uh, Earth is actually going to have a more eccentric orbit. And this happens every 100,000 years. And it really occurs because there are other planets pushing and pulling uh, on our planet, specifically Jupiter and Saturn. They have a very, very large role to play in this particular cycle and it's very regular it's every hundred thousand years 
Now this is one. This is the first Milankovitch cycle. There's another one. And oh, and by the way, Milankovitch was actually a scientist who discovered these uh, a long time ago. And there's a lot of proof behind this. Uh, if you actually look at uh, various uh, chronological markers, like for example, from old ice in the in the Antarctica, it will actually show you that this actually occurs. The other one, number two, is called obliquity. This is basically a really interesting kind of a cycle because it refers to how much of an inclination our planet has depending on the period. So this happens about every 40,000 years and what, it ha what happens is this. We currently know that our planet has uh, obliquity of 23.4 degrees. This is a current one. Now this changes plus minus one degree every 40,000 or so years. Basically, it kind of, if I were to zoom in here, uh, and I'm going to just make it a little bit more visible by putting at it here. So basically what happens is this. Where is, where is our... Here we go. What happens is that it changes. It does this. It does this, but a lot a lot less obviously. This I'm, I'm exaggerating this. So it does this every 40,000 years. Because it's sort of like... If you ever play with um, uh, one of those spinny toys and you try to spin it, you'll notice that sometimes it starts wobbling. So this is kind of what our planet is doing. And this is a very r regular recurring thing, but it doesn't happen at 100,000 period, uh, 100,000 year period, but it actually only happens about 40, every 40,000 years. And the last cycle is called the precession cycle. This is this happens every 26,000 years. And this is actually the cycle that uh, people are saying might be responsible for the ice ages, or at least one of the cycles. Uh, so this happens every 26,000 years. And what this does is essentially, this, this is a pretty good picture. It, it sort of rotates the axis of our planet. So it, it, it's a wobble, but in a different type of direction. So it's kind of like this. This is what it does. So it, it, I can't really... I can't really rotate it the whole way, but it basically does this. So this happens every 26,000 years. Uh, it does one cycle. Now, th this is a really long term scale. So the thing is, um, what if this happened a lot faster on, on the known world? What if the known world has these Milankovitch cycles that happen like a thousand times faster? In other words, this one happens every 100 years, this one happens every 40 years, and this one happens every 26 years. If that is actually, you know, if this is the case, you would actually have a really interesting, uh, quite unpredictable weather or climate phenomenon on your hands. And let's actually take a look at what happens if you vary those uh, three things. Specifically, we're going to vary the uh, obliquity, we're going to vary argument of uh, obliquity and also eccentricity. Um, I'm going to do this every few years and basically I'm just kind of waiting for this to stabilize because I did move the world a little bit So that's why the temperature went up, but right here. It's already quite stable. So uh, every uh, So let's just say every year we're going to increase this a little bit increase this a little bit and so on Actually, this is already changing by itself So I don't even have to touch it, but eccentricity and obliquity will be changed So let's start it now and just watch what happens. So I'm going to do this Sort of predictably, uh, I'm going to maybe vary this by 2 degrees and then vary this by about 0.6 or 0.06. And then uh, we'll see what happens to the actual um, average temperature of the known world. So right now it's about 19 degrees Celsius average and we are at year 62. So let's just say we start it now. So right now it's going to become 24 degrees and this will become maybe 0.01.
perhaps I can get him justice. Alright, so I've ran this simulation for about a hundred years now, I actually started right here, even more than a hundred years, and you can see that compared to the stable uh, climate change right here, or seasonal change right, right in the beginning, this is very, very unpredictable. So we have all of these warm and very, very cold climates, so like, for example here there was a big spike here, we had a very uh, large decline for about 20 years, here there's a huge decline for about maybe 40 years, and here we're going for another really long winter. And this of course suggests that Milankovitch model might actually explain why there is such a random or a, a random in appearance seasonal change on the known world basically in, in the Game of Thrones. Because if you look at this image compared to this image, it's a little bit hard to predict what's going to come next. Is it going to be winter? Is it going to be spring or summer? Because some of them are definitely a lot more colder, or some years here are a lot more colder than others, and right now I think we hit the long winter, because I stopped changing this. And uh, so yes, Milankovitch model, if it's actually uh, done in uh, on a scale of about 100 years, 40 years, and maybe uh, 26 years, would actually explain the seasonal changes in the Game of Thrones. And I guess the main question here is why is this happening? Why is it, um, or why is the Milankovitch model here on the scale of, you know, anywhere from 26 to 100 years and not thousands of years like on our planet Earth? Well, one of the explanations is actually kind of a hint in the book and also in the TV show. If you watch season one again, or if you read the first book, you will actually read the story the story of Drogo and Daenerys, their love story, and Daenerys at some point hears a story from Drogo about the moon, or basically uh, Drogo tells her that there used to be two moons, and then one wandered too close to the sun and cracked like an egg, spilling thousands of dragons into the world. Now this is important, because what this suggests is that at some point, at some point in history, I'm going to remove this for a second, at some point in history the known world had not one, not one, but two moons, and at some point in history, that second moon disappeared, or maybe it flew into the sun, something happened, it basically it exploded and became a bunch of rocks, so we can actually explode it now, because we have this new button in the new version called explode, bye bye moon number two, there you go. Happen this is what happened, so maybe there was some fragments that fell to the, uh, to the planet, maybe something else happened, but what this actually did, if there were two moons before, what this did to our to our planet, to the known world, not to our planet, to their planet, is that it probably made it wobble, its orbit became unstable. And the reason I'm saying that is because our moon is actually responsible for making the rotation of our planet and various cycles on our planet very stable. It's actually, because of its gravity, it protects our planet from various unpredictable variations. If you remove our moon, our planet is probably going to go crazy and start wobbling everywhere, start shifting everywhere, and this is probably what occurred in the Game of Thrones, at least that's what I think. I think when that second moon was removed for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm assuming that legend was probably true, it's probably something that um, Drogo has heard from his parents and from his parents' parents, and it probably is something that actually happened. So the second moon was removed, and the known world became unstable and started wobbling more, started shifting its um, elliptical path, or in other words, its obliquity, uh, and uh, or, or argument of obliquity started changing as well, and possibly even eccentricity as well. So in other words, because that second moon was lost, Milankovitch cycle became a lot faster than it was otherwise. And, and this really possibly caused the unpredictability of seasons um, in the Game of Thrones and also why the seasons are so unstable now. And really the only solution to this problem is of course time. So if we wait millions of years, the known world will eventually stabilize its, its um, wobble with, with the only moon that it has left. And they will probably um, acquire kind of a new new balance between each other, they'll actually start balancing each other a little bit, and so th that is the only thing that will stabilize the climate and the seasons on the planet. Now this was my explanation for why Game of Thrones has such unpredictable seasons, but I'm sure George R. R. Martin has a more magical explanation for us that he'll uh, disclose in the future books. Anyway, thank you for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, subscribe and check out some of the other Universe Sandbox 2 or other awesome videos that I've posted. And what is this? Moon Remnant? What are you doing? Let's explore it.
Definitely tell me what you thought about this video, if you liked it or not, or what are your theories? Why is the known world so unstable and so unpredictable? And why is it going to explode right now? Oh no, I destroyed it. Anyways, thank you for watching guys, and game you later. Bye bye.